Feather Captain is a longtime GNU Linux user and free software enthusiast with a background in democratic discourse ethics. So without further ado, let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Thank you. This is my first time at Libre Planet. Uh, I want to thank the FSF for giving me a free copy of free uh, software, free society some years ago. Thank you. So this is one version of my identity uh, as an old lady. Uh, I've been a user for quite some time. <clears throat> I think it's important for you to know who's speaking so you can interpret what their words are, right? It's not just the truth of what I say. It's you understanding how, what kind of lens to put on it to interpret what I'm saying. So at a time in my life when I was working on my dissertation looking at democratic discourse in intentional and in consensus-based housing associations, old timers, very successful at it, I was comparing how they thought good process should go and compared it to some radical theories of democracy that were being called in my field of urban planning and urban studies too abstract, too theoretical, not practical in the real world, can't be done. And I said, no, I've been part of these communities. Uh, they do it. It can be done. And so I compared. It was like an applied philosophy approach. I went native inside communities and said, this is what I love about us. I'm visiting your community because you're such an outstanding example of it. Can you tell me what you think is good process and what's bad process? And I forced them to repeat themselves over and over until they went, oh, I'm so sorry. I feel so clumsy. I don't know what to say. Because I was forcing them to say everything they could. And the theory is um, Jürgen Habermas's theory of communicative action. I'll say more about that. Oh, so I was going crazy writing my dissertation on this topic, 360 pages. And for my free time, I went to FreeGeek and was taught how to take apart and rebuild computers and put free software on them. And I fell in love with the builder instructor. And he's been a Debian developer for 14 years. I don't know how many years, 16 years. So when I talk about open collaborative decision making models, he talks about Debian. So finally, after a decade, I started going to DevConf. And I've been speaking here and there and trying to be useful. Background, I want to tell you what I think the commons is. Shared resources, shared responsibility, shared benefit. So we're talking about, uh, in capitalist terms, shared ownership and control. But it also means that, that I have responsibility, right? And it helps the others that I'm working with. So I can't really get what I want without working with them. In the digital commons, I'm going to include everything. And when I say the commons, in terms of the software commons, I think it might be more useful to expand it to the digital commons. What are we talking about? So let's say it includes not just the code, but the infrastructure, the standards, the human labor and commitment, knowledge and culture, tools for accessing world resources. If you don't even have a computer or know what one is, do you have access to those resources? Who can say everybody has access when most of the world doesn't have a computer? So the tools for accessing world resources that the free and open source software movements are creating are crucial. The job of governing shared projects, tools for accessing world resources. So these are just examples. I'm not going to say it's inclusive of everything. It's important. Um, So the reason I entitled the talk the way I did is because there's quite a bit of difficulty in crea creating codes of conduct that people all feel happy with and can agree to. And if these aren't something that everyone agrees are important, it's really difficult to enforce them. Uh, personally, uh, I see people who I disagree with quite vehemently who don't like to treat humans the way I want to see humans treated are saying they don't like the codes of conduct 
and they have some good reasons. And I don't want that baby to get thrown away in the bathwater. I don't want us to make rules that are hurting things like equal participation under the law, equal rights under the law. So that's just one example. I'm telling you where I'm coming from. So I'm saying let's step away from deciding what exactly will go into our code of conduct. And I want to talk to you about, from my lens, what do I see when I see people talking about the commons? And it's about shared power in terms of communications, not just ownership. And the theory base that I've worked on, the reason why the open, uh, free and open software movement seemed to apply so well to the theory base I'm working with is that it requires that people are actually going to deliberate. They're going to step away from the action. They're going to talk about why it is they were getting in each other's way. They're going to come up with a, a solution that allow each of them to independently, voluntarily follow their own interests in a way that allows other people to do the same. That's one of the criteria. And a commitment to using good arguments that anyone who heard and understood the arguments would probably agree with. These are large demands. So the fellow who formulated this theory, I worked on his theory based from 81, where he was talking about kind of Marxian concerns of power imbalances, but in terms of communications, and how power imbalances distort communications. How in the world can you uh, say you've made a rational decision about something when you've systematically excluded the people affected by your decision. That's an example of a contra reason. So I'm going to say that one of the reasons why it's helpful in thinking about uh, what free and open source software governance is in terms of communications is you might think of it as a organizational intelligence. We're thinking about how do we maintain our organizational intelligence. And by organizing, I mean all the people you want to share collaborations with now and into the future. And my conclusion at the very end is that we need to create and protect safe places for conflict. Because in order to argue, to use good reasons that everyone could theoretically understand and, and, and support if they understood them, and they need to be able to argue about it to come up with those reasons in the first place. You need to have people able to make statements, to challenge statements, to set the agenda, and to then validate what do we all think might be the right way to go. So that's really my whole talk. I just said everything. All great. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> so I pay attention to social movements. And because you just walked in, I will say that um, at a moment in my life where I was wondering what the social movements were that would be interesting support, I had just come out of back of the woods in Maine and had gone to Illinois to this major computer engineering university. One of the things that came up on my Unix screen when I was figuring out what is this text thing was this propaganda from Richard Stallman saying this should be free. <laughs> it's wonderful. So. Um, in the middle of this talk, because the only other thing I have to say are examples and expansions on what I've already said, I've asked the timekeepers, because I'm a facilitator thinker, right? I've said, I need your work. <laughs> Please help me facilitate a, a, a part of the middle of the talk where I'm going to ask you to generate some problems that I can consider. And I'll show you how I use my framework for understanding communications in this kind of deliberative environment. And I'll feed back to you, not the answers to your questions, but how to maybe unpack the problems it, from this theoretical lens that's not what most people think about, just to share you, with you some of my mind space. I'll come back to some of these things here. Uh, so the name of this part, I'm going to call uh, the method a popcorn method of facilitation. I'm asking you to produce the popcorn. The things are going to pop up out of the room. What we love about the software commons. 
give it five words, name it in five words, raise your hand, name it in five words, and I'm going to call on the next person. I know you're going to be thinking about the problems in the software commons. I'm asking you to do the mental processing of what the problem is that doesn't allow you to keep the thing you love. And then turn it into a positive statement about what you love. <laughs> That's your work. And we're not all going to do all that work. We're not going to listen to your whole story. But we want to hear the answer. What are the f Name something you love about the software commons in five words. And the timekeepers will give us five minutes to do that. Yes? People care about others. I'm going to repeat what they say so you don't have to take the time with the microphone. People care about others. Occasional respect for prior art. Occasional respect for prior art. <laughs> Two people in the back. Go ahead. Openness to new ideas. Openness to new ideas. Defending our freedom. Defending our freedom. Yes, Sam? Um, build, uh, building, collaborating, reusing, expanding. Building, collaborating, reusing, and expanding. Democracy. Democracy. Being useful is a loving act, and that's why you love free software. Thank you. Sustainable cooperative autonomy. Sustainable cooperative autonomy. Wow, these are also nice words. I'm, I'm going to try to find the problems we have here. OK. If broken, I can fix it. If broken, I can fix it. I have one for you. Uh, confronting proprietary software injustice. Confronting proprietary software injustice. I can learn from examples. I can learn from examples. Many brains better than one. Many brains work better than one. I'm going to pause here. Did anyone feel like they haven't had a chance to say at least one? Go ahead. Uh, accessibility across demographics. Accessibility across demographics. OK, since that was so successful, I'm going to change it and create a new one. How much more? We have two more minutes. Three more minutes. And now that you've practiced and learned how to be succinct, I'm going to ask you to name a thing that a behavior in people that makes those things you love Difficult. Sam? Not considering our input. Not considering our input. Arguing for its own sake. Arguing for our own sake. Did I catch you late earlier? Did you? Arguing for our own sake. Its own sake. Oh, just to argue. Yeah, but I liked it. <laughs> Go ahead. Sean? Solving everything with technology. Richard? Some so value convenience over freedom. Valuing convenience over freedom. Low emotional intelligence. Low emotional intelligence. Yes? Not invented here, real reinvention. Not invented here, re. Real reinvention. Like reinvention. Reinventing the wheel, thank you. Those easy ones are. Predominant emancipation, collaboration, and connection. Could you repeat that louder into my mic? <laughs> Freedom, emancipation, collaboration, connection, community. Yeah, all that Latin stuff, it's hard to remember. Um. <laughs> Is that about our five minutes? It feels like. Oh, we have more. Go ahead. Prioritizing the short term. Prioritizing the short term. I have one more minute. All right, how about we'll change it again? Say something that's similar to this sentence. That person shut him down. An actor and an acted upon. A subject and an object in the sentence. The man kicked the dog. One I heard yesterday about a debate that I feel is very important is a person saying, too many foot posts too quickly. Right? Posted important stuff, but the, took over too much of the bandwidth on the list. Author intentionally obfuscates. Author intentionally obfuscates. Go ahead. 
They assumed bad intention. Yeah. So it seems like we've saturated the room. People feel like we've represented some of the ideas here. Those were the anecdotes. That's what you just did. <laughs> so before I jump into this table about stating, challenging, and validating, and about the topics of truth, trust, and appropriateness, I'm going to go back here. What is deliberation? And I'm going to operationalize it in terms of saying, OK, I mean something specific by it. I mentioned earlier the idea of um, where there's a commitment to say you're in a war and you have a gun in your hand. You're not going to try to deliberate while your gun is pointing at the other person. Maybe you will have to do this. This is not the ideal case. Um, I'm talking about, in that case, I talked about the criteria for this uh, theory applying. It's about when you're really trying to reach understanding about what would be best, right? And in this case, now I'm talking about the acts and how to understand what's being said when we hear an argument. Here are six key words that I've found that I think are accessible that might help any moderator, facilitator, leader from the back benches help parse what's going on and thinking about a solution. So I broke it up into two types, actions and topics. Let's say that no matter what you're saying, you're making a statement about fact, trust, and appropriateness. I mean, there are other forms of communication, but in this context, you're usually saying, my fact's right. I'm being sincere. You can trust me. And it's appropriate in this context to be talking about this. I'm actually on topic. Or the topic's legitimate. You know? And in the, the ideal world, in the case where actually humans can deliberate on norms and decide what would be best, and we don't have to just call it public your opinion and that's only you and it doesn't have anything to do with our common goal. We can deliberate on what we think would be best, what would be appropriate in this ideal case. And then and, and in the real world, we can look at which part of the ideal case is missing. So in the ideal case, everybody gets a chance to make a statement and be heard, right? In the ideal case, any person can challenge that and say no. In the ideal case, anybody is part of setting the rules, setting what's on the agenda. So for an example, if there's a certain type of class of person that you don't trust, their statements are not going to get through to you. You might not even hear them. And if it's a power that knows that you are a threat to them, your challenges will be filtered. This is a problem with monopolies taking control of our communication systems. I'm not going to come up and try to get Google taken apart as a monopoly. That would just be silly. <laughs> Some people feel they can do that. I, I don't personally. And then the topics is more about uh, different kinds of statements. So if different kind of challenges. So if I challenge someone's fact being incorrect, if someone challenges your code and says it doesn't even say that, if they challenge the, the, the point of fact that you bring up, that doesn't mean they don't trust you and that you're not being sincere. It means they found something to correct because they're using objective me measures to, trust your, to look at your facts, which is completely different than trust. I might not trust you, but feel your facts are correct. So if we can parse that out, Sometimes uh, someone will be challenged on one, and we try to s solve it with a solution to the other. The problem is someone doesn't trust the authority speaking, and the authority only says, no, look, my facts are right. But trust takes history to look at. You want to look at who have you helped in the past? Who owns you? What is your role in that position? Are you a mouthpiece? Did I drink with you two years ago and see how you act when you're out of it? You know, these are ways of building trust. No one came up with a really pithy example of a problem that I can solve and show you how to use this table. <laughs> you did, but I have to admit, it just kind of washed over me. 
but I'll tell you about some of my bugaboos, some of the things, and then we, we should still have question and answer, and then I can take more specific questions. So, um, thank you. I think codes of conduct are important because the way we conduct ourselves makes it possible for us to go, uh, govern ourselves. And I do think it's the communications need to be moderated in order to make sure everybody has the freedom to be part of those discussions. But I'm concerned about codes of conduct for reasons that people who don't like codes of conduct will bring up constantly. Pro uh, creating protected classes of people which I benefit from. I've been asked to speak and to have wonderful trips overseas paid for, or not overseas necessarily, but travel paid for because I'm a woman from the social sciences, which is outside, and it's this diversity thing. So I've benefited from it. But these protected classes change, get, give a precedence to the idea that you can decide the law applies differently to one set of people than the other. I'm not saying the code of conduct should not mention treating women and others well. I'm just saying let's think about the long-term consequences because the free software mo movement is huge, powerful, and it's successful. And we are providing the examples to others. So when I go to a Mastodon instance and go, oh, wow, these, these folks have a great conversation going. I want to be part of it. And one of the code of conducts are don't argue, no discussion of current events, and you can't speak to a topic unless you identify as one of those people. If someone asks about gays on a scholarly site, um, you're only supposed to answer if you're gay. <laughs> like, wait a minute, that's really problematic. But that doesn't mean that that discussion shouldn't happen. And it's really nice to see a creative way of addressing the, need, the, the deliberative needs of that community. But these codes of conduct are proliferating everywhere. So let's think about how we're writing them. So I, what I'm going to suggest is, in the way we write the codes of conduct, do people have an open opportunity to talk about whether the facts are right? Do they have a way to learn how to trust each other? And do uh, they have common access to uh, establishing what the appropriate norms should be? So I have a gender problem online. Being female means many things to many people when they're trying to, you know, you have to figure out who's speaking in order to understand what they're saying. I can give an example from a, a talk I asked at the end of this open source community organizing conference at OSCON, the community conference, uh, the John O'Bakelancy, and I asked at the end of one of the first of them, can I be part of this uh, community without a Google account? And the audience started snickering and laughing, and one person yelled from the other side of this huge room, oh, another Bradley Coon. <laughs> And I felt pressured. I mean, it was hard enough. I'm an outgoing person. I like to talk, but I like to talk for everybody's benefit. I was trying to help people find another way for the membership to happen without requiring this Google account. But I felt uncomfortable with that kind of response. And at the end, I, I left. I went out to the hallway. I sat in the lobby. And I was just trying to get my heart to slow down. And two smart, yet young techie men who were sitting near me looked over and thought they'd be helpful. They saw who I was, they judged. Okay, we can guess where she's coming from. And they said, so Google is used when you want to look for something online. <laughs> so I don't want to have to use a female pronoun sometimes when I post online. And this is around trust, right? This is about identity. Another way we can use trust is when we're interpreting what somebody's saying by what company they work for. Do I want to be put into that particular pigeon box, pigeonhole, you know? Do I trust the way this person has represented themselves in the past? So this is an, uh, the reason why this is powerful is it's, you could say objective, subjective, intersubjective. Usually we say we cannot deliberate on subjective concerns. But I'm going to say, well, let's think of it more simply as just a matter of understanding this black box that's inside the experience of my head. Can you trust that I'm representing it accurately, that I'm at least trying? And if you know me well enough, you'll know the things not to trust me for. Like, I'm probably late. I might forget somebody's name, you know? But you might trust me in other ways that are very important and allow you to gain something from what I'm wanting to share. 
And appropriateness is about any kind of rules, really. And then the common example I like to use is, uh, well, like, let's use one from recently. Debian has amazing principles around use agnosticism. It's for any use. Don't put a control on how somebody can use the software. I think of that as part of the reason why politics and the importance of a political movement isn't something many Debian developers want to support or dissuade just because they're contributing their code. They don't want to have to necessarily address an international boycott about a location for a conference. I don't want to go to Israel. There's an international boycott against Israel right now in the UN, and I think it has good cause. But I can't tell Debian I don't think you should be in Israel because I'm not, I, yes, I'm very involved, I'm, I'm interested and I have my heart in Debian, but I am not one of the people making the decisions about what Debian will be. That's a developer concern. And I have to trust that that important use agnosticism principle is more important. So I can set up warnings and go, I hope we pick a reason that is, is, uses principles that will apply to future places. <laughs> But it's not because I agree with that ruling, that decision. It's because I believe that there was really good process used. I, I respect the Debian community and the collaborative governance model that's been used to establish these principles and to follow them and the commitment of the people to follow those social contracts. And I'm going to go, OK. Yeah. That's the decision. It might be a really good idea. So that five-minute warning, is that for when we start question and answer? Yeah. But I want to back up a little bit from examples that get me all heated up. Um, I think it's kind of clear. I, I, I'm wondering, does it seem kind of clear? Breaking it up, stating something, challenging something, validating something? Go ahead. Because sometimes you can like argue. You can say true, not true, true, not true. You want a process in your organization that allows you guys to decide, you know, is it true or not. And the objective stuff tends to be easier in tech communities. Um, this whole thing about whether the rules apply also can work if, you, if people all agree with the rules, uh, the rule set. But remember, it also should include being able to change the rules. And sometimes when you have a single founder, powerful person, it can be difficult to argue about the rules changing. So we're going to be an imperfect world. But if there's some things you can challenge and other things you can't, you can't challenge somebody's sincerity without hurting their reputation. That's a big problem, I know, in Debian. Because so much a huge motivating factor for so many contributors is their reputation. And they can't even get their work done if they don't have their reputation. And if you say something that hurts their reputation, you might cause a meltdown in their home. <laughs> and you're going to see maybe the the overflow of that online. And I don't know how to solve it, but I do think it's helpful. I think it's helpful that I can look at that and say, I wonder how to solve it. And so I want to share that, you know, that it's a problem, that reputation is that important. Yeah. I don't really have more to say without more questions or something. <laughs> so that's all for now. So I'll, I'll take questions. If we don't need a whole 15 minutes for questions, then I'll suggest setting up circles of people to talk about problem solving. Go ahead. Hi, can you, uh, can you suggest couple of uh, open source software communities uh, that have, uh, my, my apologies, uh, can you suggest some uh, iconic free software communities that uh, were successful in putting together a code of conduct, as in, like, can you give some good examples? Uh, the answer is no, but I would like other people to suggest something they thought was useful. I know one is a, a, a feminist uh, code of conduct that's been used quite often. I don't know that that's the best one. But if people would like to speak to what they think is a community doing it well, go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, maybe you could do that. Yeah, um, this room it may, might make it difficult to walk up to the mic, but. So I was just going to suggest Public Lab as a good example of a community that's doing a code of conduct. A little lab. louder, it's not quite up. At the Public Lab, it's a community science organization that uses uh, free software and free hardware to do primarily environmental science and activism. And they have a really well-considered code of conduct and code of conduct enforcement mechanism. And I think the enforcement is just as key as the code itself. Um, and I know they're very open about discussing it. So if you want to be put in touch with some of the people involved with that, I'm happy to introduce you or anyone. And I, I meant to plug your talk the other day if people want to go back and hear it about collaborative governance. Uh, nice, simple, straightforward pictures of the trees of some organization and what impact that has on their governance. Uh, so. Hello. A uh, question about deliberation. Um, I've worked on some codes of conduct deliberatively, and one of the criticisms that I've gotten uh, was that deliberation puts an undue burden on uh, people who are underrepresented and might not have enough time um, to participate in that deliberation. Uh, do you think that's a fair criticism, and have you seen any uh, ways to counteract that? Mm -hmm. Of course it's a fair criticism. If you have time to sit all day and someone else has to clean everybody else's toilets. You, know, you don't have that time. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying in the real world, you'll always have some participating and some not. What impact is that having on you? Do you think you're making decisions for everyone's benefit that have completely lost input? Um, one helpful suggestion is don't underestimate the amount of time and energy it takes to do these things. When you do a code of conduct, you are, it's almost constitutional. Don't be so upset that it's only take, it's taken you two weeks to write one page. This is maybe too fast. You need to do research. You need to really understand. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't want to throw something together quickly for your conference so that you can keep the peace. I'm just saying long term, it's a big job. How do you find these folks? In public, uh, in the public sector, there are rules, of, and for example, in environmental, uh, environment, mm, environmental, the government agency, yeah. EPA. There are nice sets of process rules about, we will make a proposal, we will leave a time for public comment, we will respond in this much time, if there are ongoing concerns, we'll let it be known. I mean, issue tracking is really helpful, that kind of thing. The free software movement has issue tracking, which I wish a lot of public deliberations had. Hmm. Uh -huh. I have a question from Low Planet 7583. How does anony anony anonymity within a group <laughs> deliberation affect ideas of trust and the theory of communi communicative action? Speak louder. Do How it one more time. Okay. How does an Anonymity, anonymity within a group deliberation affect ideas of trust in a theory of communicative action. Yeah, so how does, if the participants are anonymous, how does that affect trust? It's huge, right? You don't know who's speaking. So sometimes you have to, you have to trust the norms of how uh, the information is gathered. We have stand-ins, just know, oh, I don't know how to trust these people um, because I don't know which one spoke. In the case of Debian, uh, there's a voting system that I might trust, and I know who the membership were, and I knew that only a certain number of votes uh, were accrued to each person. So I'll go, okay, I don't know who the people were voted on that, but I'm gonna trust that information gathering, decision-making system, because it's not perfect, they're doing the best they can, I'm gonna go with it, you know? The only thought I had about uh, uh, anonymity is if you were going to allow one person to be anonymous, then you should maybe make everyone anonymous so that it's a even level playing field as far as anonymity. You know, some people aren't well known and other people aren't. Everyone's anonymous. But then I worry about what the discussion's gonna be like if everyone's anonymous. You know, there's a level of civility that comes with identity. Anyway, I have no profound uh, no, solution that, there. Thank you for thought. that. I think that's exactly what 
I think that's exactly the thought process we should be going through when we ask these things. And the answers will be different in each community. That's why I'm not telling you how to do it. But those are the kinds of concerns. Yeah. Jeffrey, you know, you, what you could do is you have people be anonymous for the purpose of their actual, who they actually are. Can people hear that? Special, they have a special uh, identifier Some for the particular hear. meeting. Can you repeat it because I was busy yelling? I'm, sorry. I'm suggesting that you can have people be anonymous as to their real person, but that for a particular meeting, they're identified. They, if somebody says X and then they say Y some other time, that they that it's the same. You know, it's the same person. Yeah. So the Debian uh, community has a vetting process. So I don't know exactly which de developer spoke, but I know they've been vetted. So that's an example of building trust in an environment that protects speech, uh, protects their privacy. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, Just speak a little yeah. clearly and more loudly than you think you should. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, first um, I would like to thank you for creating the safe environment. I think everyone failed uh, really great on like answering and doing your uh, popcorn participation. Um, um, first, um, it, it's more like a comment. Um, you mentioned uh, your view on the pronouns and like first I would like to say that I really respect your view and like, like the reasons you have uh, for like I, I understood you prefer not to use them, uh, but I would like to offer like an alternative for that. Why like some people like choose uh, to use pronouns, and I think that historically, as you said, like trust is a question of history too. And historically, we have a death with like several groups, and uh, we have to give these people like like freedom as you like fighting for freedom here, giving them like freedom to speak, to, to speak and like to do whatever they want. And like representation, visibility, and protagonism are like key words on that. And I think that the pronouns, like they help expose that. Uh, everything we do every day, and it's not because we are like technical people that like we are not political. We are like social political beings every day. So. The reason why uh, I come to the conference, for example, and I sign myself my email and like all the sponsors here is to tell them it's important that you're here. The reason I pick all like the female speakers to attend all their talks, even if I won't understand what they are saying, is that to say like, I'm glad you're here and like I support like more women in this conference. So I think these are all like we need to give voice to that and like visibility is super important. Um, and like if you can tell more about like this, like how, like if, tr sorry, if trust is not there, how can we break this trust for like this, these other like groups? Thank you. Break the trust for the other groups or increase the trust for other groups? Yeah, kind of like certain groups that are like profiled in a way that they like, uh, there yeah. is no like historical trust on them. Like how, for example, um, yeah, it, let, like, me, let me, let me yeah. answer. Thank yeah, you. okay. Um, I think an important part of the way I address that question is who's the audience? So when I speak, when I put together this presentation, I think of myself as talking to, and I'm not saying anyone in this room or everyone in this room is like this, but I think of, I'm talking to an autistic system administrator. And that's the hardest case. So I try to speak to that person because, for example, in Debian, I believe that the membership is largely people who come from that kind of background who are thinking about systems, setting up systems for real communities. Not everybody, right? Um, and so I'm thinking about, okay, you weren't, or you're an engineer and you were never allowed to read books other than one science fiction book you did in your four years of college. How do I introduce the idea of bringing in social soft science into your community to help you, right? But if I'm speaking to an activist community uh, about how to uh, increase their visibility, then I'll talk about things like, excuse me, what is your name, the woman right here? Yeah. What? Mary Kate. 
I would suggest first maybe uh, listening to Mary Kate's talk yesterday, talking about the use of social movement uh, success and how free software people can use that. Um, you want there will be different types of uh, players. Some people will be right out there in front pushing certain norms, boundaries, and some people will be go back and look very conservative because they have those people on the outside making them look like the more rational, moderate choice. Right? There are these whole world there that I'm not talking to about in this talk. I'm mostly saying. It's, let's not just divide things into the facts, the hard science, and the so, soft social stuff. Let's think about how it all works together. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, so a common problem that I've been seeing a lot of lately is that trust seems to be um, dependent on the content of an idea. And for example, um, whether you agree or disagree with a certain point determines the basis for whether or not you are trusted in a certain group. And that's independent of the accuracy or verification of the fact and of your sincerity and of whether or not it's appropriate. Yeah. So what would you say in communities where this is happening are some tools or language or structures that can be used to help facilitate trust and allow for good faith arguments over statements that can be controversial and lead to a baseline distrust? Mm. <clears throat> I could unpack that and say anything I want because um, the first thing I was thinking before you kept talking <laughs> was that it's going to be universal. Any group of people are going to have some baseline norms that they consider the base of the, the, the civil reality of anyone they're willing to listen to. You know, for my Protestant American pioneer side of my family, the hard line was no Greek walking into their kitchen in the middle of the night and opening the refrigerator and looking in was going to be allowed in their house. Now, because the boundaries in, in the Protestant culture are very, very important, it's part of our rationality, our history of thought comes from some of this idea of separating things into categories and encyclopedias, and they're very embedded with that, right? With the Greek side of my family, anybody who says to your face in the middle of an important conversation, I'm leaving now, the time's up, and walks away, is not someone they would ever have anything to do with. That is beyond the pale of humanity. And I love them. <laughs> and hate them, they're doing. Um, so those are just really kind of big ideas, but uh, silly examples. But I'm just saying that freedom, the free in the free software, is kind of like a standard that's been set for this conference. We're not going to go into the, the uh, concerns about whether some open source licenses are actually, by definition, are actually free. No, we've said it and said, no, free, here. Or we've come accepting that. But then you asked at the end of your question, what methods do we use to open that up? <laughs> right? It depends where you are. And, and some affirmative action's been tried now in the free software community, wanting more women, wanting more people of color, trying to hear from people they don't normally hear from. That's a method. I don't know what, you know, there are lots. If you're facilitating a meeting, you might do things like asking if you've already said once, can you please hold on until everybody else who's wanted to speak can speak, and then you can now repeat yourself or say something new. I mean, there's always a method for this, and that's why I decided to come in not as an expert to know what to do, but to suggest, yes, please, look for a method like this. There's another column I sometimes put on these, which is um, when we're trying to validate whether something's objectively true, whether something uh, is really trustworthy, and whether something really is legitimate. There are very different kinds of tests. And I think that's one of the part of the values of it. So if you're saying something that's very, very true, but you're very, very powerful in this movement, and you speak to someone to their face, you're going to hurt them because you're coming with a ballistic missile. 
you used to be a gadfly all your life. This is where I was, right? A kid in the classroom. I was always the loud little girl, you know, asking the hard questions of the teachers, and I didn't understand why some teachers didn't like it. But once I became a professor and was talking to a crowd and I criticized someone, I threw them out of their seat and maybe they would drop out of school because of the force of my voice. I was no longer a gadfly. I'm now a very powerful actor. So just recognizing the size and the power of your voice is important. That's not on. No. Say it and I'll repeat it. What sources do you recommend for further furthering learning about theory and communicative action? Uh, the, the theory of communicative action uh, was developed by a man named Jürgen Habermas. The work that I worked on was uh, his uh, early work in the, the 70s, translated into English in the 80s, called the theory of communicative action. He came from the Frankfurt School of Germany. These were post-fascist often Jewish uh, social scholars doing interdisciplinary work on the future of humanity and culture. Um, his current, the way he is currently under, known best, uh, because he's one of the most famous white men still alive, is um, he's known in Europe primarily for being a primary voice in the architecture of the European Union. And I'm really proud of him. And I'm afraid that I don't have really accessible uh, introductions. But here are some of the originals. And you can find more accessible. You know, he, he wrote in like five line sentences and translated German. And <laughs> I used my time in critical theory per guerrilla performance art groups to help me understand what he was talking about. And my consensus-based Quaker kind of groups. And then I'd translate for myself, this English in, in a paragraph and think about it at night. I would read one paragraph and go to sleep and think about it. So I, it's not very accessible, but there are two good Wikipedia articles on here that are posted. And I think I'm going to shut there. Thank you for asking that last question.